over CBS. This is the irony of it. This is 10 years later they make this charge that I was there, and so they were accurate I was there. What was the other event you said that was true? Yes. You were at the UN birthday party, and uh -huh. there was a known communist there, Gromyko from the Soviet Union. But what was the other one? You had uh, performed for Henry Wallace? No, I think I'd supported Henry Wallace, or I'd entertained for Henry Wallace, or something like that. You see, the, uh, if both of these things had been absolute factual, what I'm, what both of them were, as a matter of fact, it didn't mean a darn thing. It didn't mean, uh, had no meaning, and then neither one were illegal, and, nor, and the other things were totally false. Had no, not even a scintilla of truth in them, but aware had gotten so reckless by this time that they didn't care whether it's true or false. Nobody ever called a hand on it. But you had, just to clear the record, you had no communist sympathies. You belonged no. to no organization. No, and you see, the, this is the whole thing, Bill. They knew that. But at any rate, CBS called me in and said, Aware's gotten hold of your sponsors, and they're canceling out on you. And you've got to correct this. And said, look, you go home and write an affidavit saying that you were misled, you thanking Aware for calling this to your attention, that you were violently anti-communist. You can't stand them. I mean, you would stomp one if you could see it. And uh, that uh, you a loyal, fine American, that you served in the American Red Cross overseas in the Middle East, and that you served in the United States Army, and that you, you're so patriotic, it just gives you a headache when you get to reflecting on it. And you make it very patriotic, but apologize and say that you did get into a couple of these, those that are true. See, this is the way you'd get off of a wares list. If you apologize to aware, volunteered to go down to the House on american Activities Committee and spill your insides on all your friends and how you got involved in this, told the FBI all of this stuff. They were all collection, garbage collection, I call them. Uh, aware and FBI were. They collected garbage <laughs> and dumped it on your head when they got a chance. So you're sitting there in your apartment in New York. All this going through my mind. You've got CBS's offer that if you'll just say, may I cup, I didn't mean it. That's I, right. I, I was just an innocent. Apologize for those apologize. things that had offended Aware. You'd be okay. Aware would take you off the list. Oh, and I also had to say in this, and say it in a polite way, Johnny, now. Don't say it in a satiric way, because they won't, they won't, it won't work. Say that you appreciate Aware's concern and appreciate many of the good things they've done and the patriotic work they've done in cleansing our industry of communism. Well, I got there and got thinking, as I said, and I said, Lord have mercy, it's like wading through my own vomit. I couldn't do something like that. Good God, I couldn't do that. When you told CBS, who very much wanted you to cooperate because it meant yes, the joke. I was making money for them. Making money for them. When you, you know, told them you couldn't do it. What happened? Oh, I didn't do that. Oh. I wrote an affidavit. I didn't write it by myself. Now, let me make that clear. Palmer Weber and Clark Foreman, two beloved friends, came over to my house. And uh, I said, I've decided I'm not going to write that aff affidavit. They won't. I want to make this a good, strong one. I'm John Henry Falk. I was raised a Methodist boy in South Austin. And uh, both my parents were Methodists. And I believe in the Constitution of the United States. And I believe that it means what it says whenever man is entitled to be confronted by his accusers and to bring witnesses in his own defense and to cross-examine his accusers. I'm quite sure CBS believes the same thing. I have been attacked by people that I don't even know that are a poison and a poisonous influence in the broadcast industry that are, for money, destroy the careers of men and women in this industry. And I will deign to answer anything they say. I'd go down to the courthouse and answer. <laughs> we couldn't have it. I'd cab down to the county court, as old man Tilly Pap used to say. I'll take you down there to that county courthouse. By God, we'll have this out. And that's what Johnny did. He was no communist, and by God, he would have his day in court. John Henry Falk turned the tables on the blacklisters and sued them for libel. Initially, a where would choose Roy Combe, notorious a special assistant to Senator Joe McCarthy to provide its defense. Johnny would turn to one of the nation's top trial lawyers. Oh, uh, Lewis Neiser, Mr. Lewis Neiser, one of the, he's not so tall, but when he gets in the courtroom, he's about 25 foot tall, Bill. And he, he felt the same indignation. He knew about their blacklisting out in Hollywood, see, because he was an attorney for the film companies. 
And we sat out and went over the whole thing. And it was kind of like sitting in a Supreme Court justice's office because here was Mr. Neiser, this multi-million dollar lawyer that I knew I couldn't afford unless I could set him on the, and Ed Murrah thought that we could sell him, that he would get indignant over this as Ed was and as I was, and that this would be a golden opportunity. And he took it on. And, and it was a, he understood it would be a very big suit. And he said, now you ready to, you know, to go through a real ordeal because you can be knocked out of work and uh, you won't work again. But we're going to do our best. We'll take hand in hand and you and I together. We'll put down this terrible plague of blacklisting in Hollywood and New York. John Henry was lucky to have found Louis Neiser. But Neiser was lucky too. Here was a case that could set an important historic precedent. And John Henry Falk was particularly qualified to bring it to court. Neiser said as much in his book, The Jury Returns. He wrote, if we had to create a plaintiff to test the false charge of communism, we could not have imagined a better one than this Texan who derived a southern drawl honestly from a lifetime spent in Austin and who garnished his lively personableness with scholarly attainments. Johnny was bright, educated, talented, but he was nonetheless a political innocent. He truly believed what was right and fair was bound to triumph if you just stuck to it. So John Henry Falk stuck to it. You had to know they'd fight back, that they would do everything they could to discredit you. Why did you file that suit? Because, Bill, I regarded it as an opportunity, an opportunity in this sense. Does a private group of vigilantes, or indeed a government group, have the right to deprive a citizen of his livelihood and his good reputation without confronting him with specific charges and bringing, bringing allegations against him in, in due, through due process of law? Because I hadn't had due process of law. I was making it. That's the reason I never felt sorry for myself. I didn't have enough money. See, I didn't, I didn't understand this business of you have to have a, a, a retainer, but Mr. Neiser said, I'm going to take this at a minimal or a minimal uh, retainer. And then he named the sum. Well, that was about $7,000 more dollars than I had. I was a very improvident person. I hadn't saved money well at all. And so I was telling old, old uh, Ed Murr about it the next day at lunch. We had lunch together because he was just tickled to death. He thought this was going to be the great trial of all time and Neiser was going to take it. And I said, well, and I hate to go and tell Neiser he's got a total pauper on his hands, although I'm making money each week. I said, you know, I haven't got that kind of money saved up to lay on him. And so, uh, bless goodness, uh, Ed Murr says, you tell Mr. Neiser, don't you say anything to him. Just tell him that 7,000, 7,500, it was just 2,500 I had. And he said, the other 7,500 will be in his office in the next week or so for me. And so when I said, oh, no, Ed, I didn't know it. Ed, I didn't know he was going to do that. Said, oh, no, I can't let you do that. He said, I'm not doing this for you. Johnny, if you needed $25 and I happened to have it, I would maybe lend it to you, although I don't make it a practice to lend money easily. But, honey, I'm investing this in America, not in you. So Murr came to your defense with yeah, money. He wrote a, he got the check, paid Mr. Neiser. And so we were off down the road. And uh, it was headlines in all the papers. I saw a $5 million lawsuit. I filed this suit in June of 1956. And all year round. And people would wonder what was keeping me on the line. You know, that I was supposed to wither and drop off when you challenge a wear out loud. And uh, August the 6th, 1957, I guess it was, Sam Slate, good friend of mine at CBS, my immediate superior there, called me and you've been fired. They're letting you out. He says they're not letting you out for any excusable reason. They said your ratings weren't what they'd like for him to be, but they're really, Arthur Godfrey's gonna take over. He had four different reasons that they were gonna let me out, see. I said, Godfrey was going to take over my time, uh, and the networks had a right to preempt pre 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 my time, and uh, that my ratings had kind of slipped and slided, and uh, they thought I'd do better with less time. 
and uh, so or go look somewhere else for a job. And I'd been too long in that same spot or something of that kind. At any rate, and uh, was kicked out of CBS. But you see, since I was so well known, I was an untouchable. And it was strange as hell, Bill, when I got fired. It's a very strange feeling to be blacklisted. And that was unique to that period that you weren't supposed to be seen with. Go down to Colby's, which was the eating place there at CBS, or any of the Toot Shores was kind of my headquarters over on 51st Street, you know. And I knew everybody that came in the habitues. Toots had a table for me and all. And people start leaving you and getting up and having to rush out. If really? you come in, I finally quit doing it because it got <laughs> embarrassing to see them get up and move away from the bar when I'd sit down in a big circle, big round circle in Toot Shores. And, and, and uh, he'd, uh, these guys would get up and catch my hand and swing. God bless you. Fight them, Johnny. And, do, 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 do. <laughs> Make sure nobody had seen it. And the number of people, Bill, guys that called me, and this is another decisive factor in me fight this case. Say, so, uh, call me at 11 o'clock at night. Johnny, uh, I'm calling you. I said, well, look, I, I'm, I'm uh, watching the show. Can I call you right back? No, I'm at a phone booth. I'm calling for a phone booth. Uh, listen, I'm going to ask you, it don't, won't take me for a minute, just say yes or no. I was at a dinner party tonight. The fellow said that the FBI had plenty of dope on you. And that, Jay, that Roy Cohn is dying to get you into the courtroom. That you were really never from Texas at all. That you're, you're, that's just part of your act. And that, were you ever in Russia, Johnny? I said, no. <laughs> have you ever been close to Russia? No, I never have. No closer than England or no closer than Cairo, Egypt, where I was when I, during the war. Why, why are you asking? Well, they said that, that you had taken instructions directly from Moscow. And they said this would be proven at the trial. I got calls like that quite frequently, uh, variations on that call, you see. Because fear, honey, had taken over this country. And as Boots said, it wouldn't hurt. It wasn't going to hurt us, but it was going to cause us to hurt ourselves. Manipulated, carefully orchestrated fear. For the next six years, John Henry would live in limbo, a celebrity out of work. And eventually, a celebrity because he was out of work. Actually, his travail was a tribute to the strength of his cause. He had sued not only Aware Incorporated, but Vincent Hartnett, the organization's leading spokesman, and Aware's backer, Lawrence A. Johnson. These people used a double whammy. On one hand, they put pressure on anyone who might think of hiring the troublesome Mr. Falk. On the other hand, they had their lawyers use every trick in the book to keep the case from actually coming to trial. I was getting hungry, running out of money. I mean, I wished out the bottom of the barrel. And uh, I hated to leave New York in defeat. I didn't know when the case was coming to trial because Mr. Cohn was very able at postponing it. He was around on a round the world trip one time and something else another time. And he had friends in the judiciary that he could work these things with. And it was a bit frustrating and mischief out of my attorneys. You remember Gary Moore? Sure. He used to be talk show host yeah. and, a, and a terribly good guy. Yeah. He was a sweet liberal Republican that just stood by me the whole time. He, he, he was a witness in my thing and he said blacklisting, a blacklisted person was like somebody that was in a closet, a dark closet, and six blindfolded with six guys hitting him with clubs. He never knew where the licks were coming from, which direction they were coming from. He was just there, the victim of them. And that best describes blacklist. See, you never knew. You never knew at a dinner party, for instance. You never knew whether you were being offensive uh, or, 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 or being a hero to them, depending on which way they saw it. So what happened when you went out to find another well, job? Well, it's strange, because they never told you. Look, you're blacklisted, you're hotter and fire, and, and, and we're not, we can't touch you. Never tell you. I'll tell you what, I had a friend that was pulling like a mischief for me. So they fixed the lights, you know how they did. When they're fixing, adjusting the lights and they don't have the star there, they have some walk-on come in and do that. <laughs> Damn, I went down there all excited. Well, we're going to make 20 bucks that night. 
And that was good money back in those days. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, it's back in the 50s. And uh, he met me at the door, Mert did, and said, Johnny, I'm sorry.